Welcome to the Get Over Yourself podcast. This is Brad Kearns. I was homeschooled K through 12, and so I developed a pretty robust attitude towards productivity. I always liked to do a lot of different things. This concept of ikigai, being able to get out of bed in the morning and have a reason for living. I mean, that, that's as important as sunshine and fresh water and all these other things we know help people to live a long period of time. Here's a quick thank you to our sponsors. They make this show possible and the tremendous production behind it online and in audio. Thank you, wildideabuffalo.com. Grass-fed, locally raised, on the Great Plains for the last 130,000 years. Quit eating that junk food feedlot cattle and get some quality meat into your life. And thank you, DNAfit.com. Cutting-edge genetic testing, delivering customized diet and exercise recommendations for your peak performance. Use the discount code GOY30. Get over yourself. Integro Probiotics make this fabulous liquid probiotic high potency. It's called Flourish, so your microbiome can flourish. Gut health is everything. Get started. Visit entegrohealth.com and Tribali Foods. Pre-made, creatively flavored hamburger and chicken patties. When you're in a rush, drop one down, fry it up. It's delicious. T-R-I-B-A-L-I. And Almost Heaven. That's the name of my sauna. These are beautiful home-use saunas made of real wood, shipped to your door, easy to assemble, and then you are rocking. That's right. I'm going from chest freezer cold therapy into the hot barrel sauna. Check them out at almostheaven.com. And the Primal Blueprint online multimedia educational courses to go primal, go keto, get a stand-up desk going, master the challenge of endurance training. Go to bradkearns.com and click on the links to learn more about these courses. If you're sick of my voice on the podcast, you can now get sick of my face, too, on the videos. And ancestral supplements. This is grass-fed liver, organ meats, and bone marrow delivered in a convenient gelatin capsule. Don't stress about cooking liver anymore. Just pop some pills or throw capsules into a smoothie every day like me. And now on to our show... Hi, listeners. It's Brad introducing the one and only Ben Greenfield. You know how we use that term, one and only, indiscriminately, about anything and everything? This time, I really mean it. This guy is one of a kind on the planet Earth. He is an extremely high-volume, high-intensity, high-performing human. I do not know how he does all that he does. I asked him that question right out of the gate. It's absolutely an amazing journey. So your responsibility in this podcast is to strap in and hold on tight and take notes and push the back play button and get a load of all the stuff that this guy's into. Oh, my goodness. And he gave a beautiful answer out of the gate when I asked him, how the heck do you do it? And one of the things he mentioned was that he doesn't consume pop culture. So he has more time, more energy to go deep into the aspects of human peak performance, especially diet, exercise, longevity, enhanced cognitive performance, enhanced sexual performance, protection against the assorted environmental offenders in modern times like electromagnetic fields and blue light. Oh, my goodness. And he's, he's an expert in all these fields. He reads a book every day. You'll hear him quote, just breezily quote, numerous books. And man, what an amazing resource. I've known him for several years, hung out in person. He was a presenter at our Primal Con event, and we hung out down at Paleo FX. And Ben is a unique guy that blends the scientific mindset and the deep thinking and the deep researcher, uh, also an accomplished writer. He has a very prolific blog at bengreenfieldfitness.com, a great book called Beyond Training, an absolute encyclopedic volume of anything related to peak performance. And he's also an accomplished athlete. So he's putting his assorted George Plimpton-like immersive journalism 
experiences to the test when he goes out there and competes. And he talks about a recent world championship that he won. So fun times from Ben. I think it's important to reflect too. He might not be for everyone because he's pretty hardcore, uh, but we're so used to living a life of ease and luxury and convenience like never before in human history. We can go through life without ever having to get cold or warm because we have air conditioning. And he's talking about the very cutting edge of cold therapy and heat therapy and mixing them every single day to deliver all these hormonal, cognitive, immune function benefits. And I got to say, my mind's spinning right now after hanging up the Skype call, but the guy pumps me up. He makes you want to be the best you can be. You feel maybe a little inadequate when you realize just how deep he's into this human peak performance scene and that you may never be able to measure up. And the show does get a little sciencey at times, but it's well explained. I think you'll grasp it. I think you'll be in the groove and you'll pick some wonderful insights to do regardless of your budget or time level of commitment. Obviously, you're not going to be following his footsteps, buying these super expensive machinery to stick up your nose or expose your balls to while you're working at your stand-up desk. In any case, here is a rare treat to hear from a human on the absolute cutting edge of peak performance and health and longevity. And when we got talking on the subject of longevity, his answer, his perspective, will absolutely touch your heart. Here goes Ben Greenfield, all-around good guy, family man, and peak performer, recently crowned world champion in the Spartan Race executive division. Ben G. Hey, man, what's shaking? Uh, just having fun in L.A., hanging with my son at UCLA just started, and hanging with my dad, who's 96, and finishing up an awesome run in life. Sick. Totally sick. How about you? Uh, I uh, just got back from from the Spartan World Championships. And was that in Tahoe? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Nosebleed How'd it go? baby. Good. Good. I I won. Let's get right into it with that, yeah. man. Yeah. Let's get right into Let's that. Let's do it. I'll I'll introduce you with the, the craziest bio ever. I'm just gonna have to read this thing, but we'll go to town. You uh, should just tell people video... that I just tell people I'm a badass speed golfer and I can bowl three hundred. Uh, if you, if you have enough frames, right? 30 frames times. Yeah. Hey, come on. Yeah. Come on now. Um, my bowling, my bowling story is, I'm you know, a decent, I used to go at lunchtime when I, when I worked, uh, 20 years ago in corporate setting and I'd roll up 130, 140, 180, 120, 108. And then one day I rolled like an 86 And then the second game was like a 93 or something. And the next game was strike, 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 spare, strike, strike, spare, strike, nine for a 231. And I printed the thing out. This was like 1997. Never bowled again. It was like it was like the the stars aligned. And then I, I just dropped the mic and left the bowling alley. That was either a traumatic or incredibly exhilarating experience for you to be able to remember those details from 21 years ago. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. So, Ben Greenfield, we caught up, and you've just returned from the Spartan World Championships. What happened out there, man? Well, Spartan World Championships, as they have been for the past four years, took place in nosebleed country. The bastards that put together those races, the race directors like to play the the earth to their advantage and do things like put races on at ski resorts where you just got to go like up and down the slopes uh not not on a gondola or on skis but by foot so they're they're painful races um and cold they're very cold like your hands are like swollen and and cold for a long time afterwards so it's not a sport for anyone with uh with uh, Raynaud's or, or any other blood flow issue. Uh, but it went well. I, uh, I competed in the, in the executive division this year and I, I won. So I can now call myself the world's fittest CEO 
uh, if you gauge the world's fittest person based on how well they can carry a sandbag or crawl underneath barbed wire. I love that. The executive division throw down, man. What, did you have any uh, worthy competition or was it a bunch of pasty soft guys that take uh, undress out of their three piece suit into their bike shorts? You know what? It was kind of the latter. It was, it wasn't an incredibly competitive field in my opinion. I, I probably just offended a bunch of people. I just realized by saying that, but, um, yeah, I mean, I still had to push myself, but it was not quite as, uh, as, as deep a field as the actual, uh, the, the pro field I typically compete in, but at the same time, considering I'm, I'm working like 10 to 12 hours a day right now running a corporation and being a CEO, I figured, uh, what the heck, I should compete in the executive division. division. Since I, I do own a suit, I mean, I've got one up in the closet somewhere. Bring it to the award ceremony at least so you could show your, your legit executive. <laughs> right, exactly. I've got wingtips, see? You know what? This tees up the ultimate Ben Greenfield question that I've been wanting to ask since I've uh, studied your game for many years, and that is yes. I did a coffee enema this morning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> How do you do it, man? I mean, you're everywhere. You're all over the place. I want to get, I want to get down and understand what your operations like. I know you started this new key on thing that's sort of become the centerpiece of of what you're all about and uh, your brand and what you stand for. But it's mind blowing uh, how many pies you have your fingers in. Well. First of all, I'm a little jaded because I didn't really grow up knowing what it was like to be uh, normal in terms of either work hours or school hours or or anything like that. I was homeschooled K through 12. And so I uh, developed uh, during that time, I guess, a, a pretty robust attitude towards productivity. I always liked to do a lot of different things, whether that would be uh, writing fiction or reading fiction or playing my violin or, you know, I was president of the chess club and, and in a band and, you know, played for the tennis team and just loved to do a wide variety of activities, you know, cooking and watercolor painting and um, <laughs> babysitting sitting and you, you name it. And so when I got to college and actually had my first taste of the of the real world, so to speak, I kind of just continued on that path. You know, I would take anywhere from 25 to 30 credits a semester. And, uh, you know, I'm moon, moonlit as a personal trainer and as a bartender and a barista and worked at a little French bakery. So I had four to five jobs in college and a full course load. And you know, went went full on pre med and wanted to be a doctor. So I spent a lot of time in the emergency room and, you know, shadowing surgeons and, you know, and spending time in sports medicine facilities. I think part of it was I just never actually did a lot of, I guess, downtime activities that I didn't find productive, like video gaming or, you know, still to this day, I might go see a movie like once a year. I don't really watch TV. I'm a complete idiot when it comes to, to politics, actually. So I guess that's where I fall short of the whole Renaissance man piece. And I would probably do a really, really crappy job explaining the blockchain to you. So I've, I've, I've kind, of, kind of wedged my way into more like health and fitness and nutrition and longevity and biohacking a little bit more than a lot of other uh, things in life. But I still, you know, I'm, I'm uh, two books into my, my first fiction book series right now. So I still like to write fiction. I still dink around on my ukulele and go play open mic nights. And so I still love to love to to uh, spend time with music. But I would say aside from like music and fiction and hanging out with my family uh, and also cooking, I just got back from Japan or took a whole bunch of Japanese cooking classes. So I still I like to cook, too. I was actually just whipping up a brew up in the kitchen earlier this morning. We can talk about this later if you want. But this is a liver cleanse week for me. So I'm doing a lot of recipes based on cleansing my liver. And, um, and so, uh, so yeah, I've just always been kind of, kind of all over the map. And I, I do like to do things like that. Like after world championships, like how, like 
schedule in a week where I'm just doing like TLC for my body. So this week I'm doing a lot of sauna and a lot of massages and, and, uh, you know, taking milk thistle extract and I'm making, I've got a big vat of kichari upstairs, which is like a split mung bean Ayurvedic cleansing stew. And so, you know, I'll be my, my, my vittles for the next week will basically be celery juice, minerals, uh, that stew and, uh, lots of teas and, uh, you know, no coffee, no alcohol, no red meat. Um, actually I, I will have coffee, but it's only up my butt every morning. And then a lot of, a lot of sauna, a lot of dry skin brushing, you know, so, so I'm spending the next week, um, just detoxing my, my body, my, my liver, not because I live a, a an unhealthy lifestyle, but I think after, you know, months and months of, of training and, you know, you got to eat 3,500, 4,000 calories a day minimum to support, you know, intense physical activity. I just, I want to, uh, to go through a little bit of a detox. So I try and throw those in a few times a year. And, uh, and then this Saturday I'll venture down into the den of Satan and go, go watch the, the UFC match. So I'll probably have a, a drink or two down there in Vegas. Oh, so you're a UFC fan. Oh Yeah. Yeah, I I like the UFC. Actually, I work with a few uh a few uh execs in in UFC, like some of the guys that that uh that own the UFC, so I can always jet down there and jump into a jump into a fight with good seats if I want to go watch in this case uh Conor McGregor. I I love to watch him fight, so I'll go down and and uh watch him fight in the uh, in the lightweight division. Well, you've tackled every other challenge, man. I, I think it, maybe it's a matter of time before you um, you jump into the cage, or what do you think? I I trained for about seven months and got my eye broken in a sparring match about three months out from my first fight. And the the break, you know, was an orbital fracture, which is not an uncommon injury in MMA or fighting, but my my eye would swell shut and stay swollen shut every time I'd blow my nose or sneeze. And I had a great deal of cognitive fatigue and brain fog for about three months, you know, and TBI concussion. And as I dwelt upon that injury and healed myself, I realized that my noggin in terms of being a father and a provider for my family is just too important to me to put it out in the line like that. And so, uh, I instead, uh, kind of scratched that itch of hitting someone by doing it, uh, across the net with a tennis ball and a racket, uh, which I consider to be kind of sort of the cognitive equivalent of, of boxing or striking without actually having to get hit in the face. Uh, if you get hit in the face during a tennis match, something went horribly wrong. So I, I, I like tennis a little bit more these days than striking sports. Yeah. I have to put triathlon in the same category. You know, I stopped so long ago and my reflection getting off the bike, uh, looking at my training logs, having completed a hundred thousand miles. I feel like I'm lucky to be here alive talking to you and the, the danger factor of riding your bicycle out on the road is probably the most dangerous thing we do by a factor of 10 to the second place. Oh yeah. I got, I got pinged, uh, just like five months ago, riding my bike in, in, oh, in, in Austin. Austin, Texas yeah. during rush hour, got a concussion. Yeah. Um, I actually wound up, I, I have all of my stem cells harvested and stored, uh, on ice down in Florida. So I had them ship my stem cells up to me and I actually injected huh. myself with mannitol, which increases the permeability of the blood brain barrier. And then I, I mainlined the stem cells into my arm via an IV. I, I did that and hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, pretty strict ketosis and a few other kind of neural anti-inflammatories for several weeks following that accident. And, uh, I, I think that's, that's key really. I mean, any time that, that you get injured, whether it's boxing or bicycling, I mean, pulling out all the stops to take care of what could arguably be one of the most important delicate organs of your body is a pretty good idea. Um, but yeah, there's actually a really good book called the concussion repair manual by Dr. Dan Engel. I think anybody that that's, you know, out cycling or, or, uh, competing in, in MMA or anything like that should own a book like that just to be able to do a little bit of TLC, you know, if shit h should hit the fan. Well, with the ketosis element of your healing regimen there, would you also 
jump onto that if you had an adverse health diagnosis, a cancer, or something like that? It depends. I mean, you know, there, there, there's there's always considerations, you know, such as the fact that, you know, people with with an, an ApoE44 gene, or even you know, like myself with an ApoE34, high intake of coconut oil and in butter and saturated fats can actually cause not only a, a pretty high increase of storage fat, but also an inflammatory response. And so, in a scenario like that, I would say choosing more of the monounsaturated Mediterranean fats type of route would be a little bit more prudent and be a better way to get into ketosis than say like, you know, putting a stick of butter in your coffee. You know, we also, of course, with Better Living Through Science have access, as you know, to things like, you know, beta hydroxybutyrate salts or, you know, uh, for a really potent source, ketone esters. So you can amplify ketone availability even when blood glucose levels are low without necessarily a high intake of saturated fat. So I would say even if you have something like cancer, you know, you, you need to take into consideration the fact that, you know, the diet that you choose might be, you know, um, causing cardiovascular risk potential while at the same time shutting off available glucose to a tumor. So you'd even want to choose your, your fats wisely and how you get into ketosis a little bit more intelligently. Um, people without that genetic issue, um, you know, people who have a, a liver and a gallbladder that seems to be able to to produce and store and release enough bile to be able to break down those fats. Um, people without any genetic issues that would cause a high inflammatory response to saturated fats. Uh, th th those folks could probably do a little bit you know, they they could do okay managing cancer on a ketogenic diet. But for the most part, you know, and, and I would imagine folks listening in are probably somewhat familiar with what you've alluded to, you know, this this whole idea of managing cancer with a ketogenic diet based on the the metabolic theory of cancer, you know, the idea that that cancer to a certain extent can be aggravated or, you know, um angiogenesis to a tumor, those type of things could be aggravated by availability of glucose and the ability of of cancer cells to go into kind of rampant production of lactic acid. So you have a net acidotic state and a whole bunch of glycolysis happening. And the idea being that if you cut off glucose to those areas, then you could potentially halt tumor growth or, or even, even, you know, kill cancer to a certain extent. And, you know, there's, there's some very good books about this. I think it's Nasha Winters who has one on ketosis and cancer. That's kind of a multimodal approach to cancer in the same way that, that Dale Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's is a multimodal approach to Alzheimer's. I forget the name of Dr. Winters book, but ultimately if I had cancer, um, I do a lot of things, but I, I would certainly limit my carbohydrate intake and glycemic variability. I would just, for me personally, uh, get into ketosis using more carbohydrate restriction, ketone salts, ketone esters, and monounsaturated fats versus saturated fats, just based on my own genetics. Uh, speaking of diet, man, you made an offhanded comment on some podcast a long time ago, and I kind of glommed onto it as a possible strategy, and I absolutely love it. And you were talking about how you spend a lot of time fasting or in ketosis, including doing intense workouts. And then come evening time, you're enjoying life with your family and all the great things that your wife's making. And that might include a good uh, dose of carbohydrates, of course, healthy, nutritious carbohydrates, but uh, kind of letting things uh, loose in the evening uh, is your way of ensuring that you're restocking glycogen for your intense workouts the next day or whatever falls ahead. But I thought that was maybe getting the best of both worlds where you spend a lot of time in those wonderful vaunted benefits of being fasted or being ketogenic and then also getting those nutritious carbs, maybe supporting gut health and definitely supporting athletic recovery. So thanks, man, because that kicked me into gear and I, I've been experimenting with that type of approach. There are, there are reasons that go beyond that, actually, that, that I would choose a dietary strategy like that. Although I thought you were going to talk about my my collection of frozen Snickers bars in the freezer and my habit of sprinkling those on top of ice cream at night. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't, I, I do actually eat ice cream sometimes. I've, I recently discovered this halo top ice cream. I don't know if you've had this before. There's like 300 calories in a pint and it's like inulin and stevia and, you know, still not the healthiest thing on the face of the planet, but man, when you can punish a whole pint of ice cream with a, with a 300 calorie, uh, uh, punishment and, 
uh, you know, I'll sprinkle like cacao nibs and even a shameless plug. I actually design an energy bar and I keep that in the freezer too. And sometimes sprinkle that on top of ice cream at night. Uh, you, you can have your cake and eat it too, to a certain extent, but you, you touched on the fact that glycogen replenishment with a post, uh, uh, kind of, kind of an end of the day feeding can be a good strategy for cyclic ketosis, right? Training your body, how to access primarily fatty acids as a fuel during the day, and then topping off the energy stores at the end of the day so that you have adequate glycogen availability for the next day's workout, which is important, especially if you're a strength or a power athlete or even a hybrid, you know, endurance speed athlete, which is what I would consider myself to be right. Like I'm, I'm dipping into the glycolytic tank far more regularly now than in the days when I was doing, say, Ironman triathlon, just based on the fact that that Spartan has a lot more heavy carries and a lot more uphill sprints and things along those lines. But I would say there are, there are two additional reasons that uh, an evening refeed, especially for an active person, um, and to a certain extent from a social standpoint, is important. Uh, a, you'll find a lot of people who follow strict ketosis or who limit carbohydrates in the evening experience a little bit of a serotonin deficit at night, which decreases your melatonin availability. And so you see a lot of people not sleeping well on a strict ketogenic diet versus uh, folks who do an evening carbohydrate feed often have great sleep because of the serotonin availability. So that's one reason that I like the carbohydrates in the evening. And then the other reason would be for me and, and for a lot of people living in a Western society where we're not, say, following some Ayurvedic principle of, you know, a uh, uh, decent breakfast – uh, lunching kind of like a king, like a great big lunch, you know, followed by a siesta usually, and then like a pretty paltry dinner, you know, and in a lot of westernized societies, dinner is kind of the prime meal of the day. And it sucks to, to go out to a restaurant or to sit down with your family and have to be incredibly restrictive, right? Like I like going to a restaurant when they bring that wonderful warm plate of bread out to the table, you know, some heirloom local sourdough or something like that with big pads of butter. You know, I'd, I'll, I'll indulge all night long on that type of thing. And, uh, you know, so from a social standpoint, allowing yourself to, to, to refeed a little bit more in the evening, especially from a, from a carbohydrate perspective is important. And then the other thing is that for my family, I, I think family dinners are incredibly important. It's a way for our own family to gather at the end of the day. In the morning, the kids are off getting ready for school and everybody's rushing around. It's just way too busy to sit down for a family, you know, as a family for an hour. Uh, so, and, and then lunch, you know, the kids aren't around and my wife's often out, you know, gardening or farming or, you know, taking care of the chickens or the goats or she's off playing tennis. And, you know, lunch is just kind of an afterthought for us. But then dinner, our entire family comes together at the end of the day and we'll play table topics and we'll play, you know, a, a Pictionary which I hate because I got to stop eating uh, every two minutes to draw some picture. Uh, but we'll, you know, we'll play Texas Hold'em. We'll, we'll talk about the day. And so it, it's a time for our family to bond. And I actually, because of that, like we eat dinner actually later than what I consider to be healthy. Right? Like I think in an ideal scenario, you'd have dinner just for digestion and everything done with before you kind of go horizontal for the night. You'd have dinner over with two or three hours before bed. But our family gathers at about 8, 8.30, at night and, you know, we'll finish dinner around nine or nine 30 and we're, we're usually in bed by 10, but we have these amazing evening family dinners that are just like th those, those are a crucial part of our family dynamics. And it, when the kids are off doing jujitsu and tennis and uh, soccer and piano and all these things at the end of the day, we can't have a 6 PM dinner. So we have dinner at like eight or eight 30 and, and yeah, that that's another scenario in which, you know, whatever we've decided to eat, I eat and my kids love to cook too. And they'll often make risottos and uh, you know, and, and cookies and desserts and, you know, uh, like, you know, rice cakes with fish and all, and all sorts of things that would cause dad to be kind of a bore if I had to sit there with a, like a, a spoon and a stick of butter. And, a, and an app typing in your right. number of grams of carbs. Right, exactly. The family dinner, man, you're on it. I remember reading that great uh, book, Fast Food Nation by Eric Slosser, been out for a while, documentary also. And he talked about how the rise of the fast food culture basically destroyed the uh, the fabric, the centerpiece of the American family, which was the family home cooked meal and the shared experience. And now you could outsource that by going through a drive through line and handing your kids what they wanted and carrying on with your busy day and watching more TV. 
society. So it was kind of a turning point in culture that we're still struggling to recover from unless you take this action and make this the centerpiece. So good, good job by the Greenfields. Yeah, and I mean, like now in the era of freaking, you know, not not that's the the healthiest food on the planet, but it's something, you know, in the era of, of things like Blue Apron, you know, and these other meal delivery services that will bring, you know, like recipe kits to your home. It's pretty easy, you know, and that that's to a certain extent, you know, between lessons from Jessa and they take some local cooking classes, and then we get, you know, boxes sometimes delivered to the house, you know, with ingredients and recipe cards. That's how my kids learn to cook to a certain extent. And, you know, even if you don't have time to to make a big complex dinner or even something like some of these meal delivery services, and, and some really are like paleo-ish or primal-ish or a little bit more healthy, um, you know, I think Freshly is one of the ones that's a little bit better. Uh, Blue Apron is okay. kind of depends on what they're delivering. But, yeah, even something like that is kind of like a hybrid way to 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 kind of sort of be at home and have, you know, what you could argue is is almost a version of fast food. But I think is is just a convenient way to get your hands on recipes and ingredients. That's that's always another option. Hey, changing changing gears a little bit and going back to that that big picture. And I think you uh, delivered an interesting insight where you said that you grew jaded uh, as as a homeschool student, jaded to what is normal. And you also told uh, Joe Rogan that you don't consume modern culture, and that gives you the time and energy to pursue the the ultimate highest level of sophistication of health and fitness. I think that's really interesting because we find ourselves today. Uh, completely maxed out on stimulation that's, uh, you know, entertainment or just obligations with email and texting and staying connected in, in, a, in a digital manner. And it leaves precious little time to work on ourselves or pursue those hobbies that you mentioned. Uh, and it's something that's really concerning to me because I find myself slipping away from, hey, I, I, once upon a time I was a writer, but I, I can't even find the time now because my, my email inbox is so, so filled. And any kind of departure into an entertainment zone can turn into a black hole when you're talking about all the, all the stuff that we're compelled to consume now with the, the binge watching of shows and, and who knows what else is distracting us and pulling us away from potential uh, human peak performance endeavors that you stand for. Yeah, I mean, I think you could, to a certain extent, say the same thing about, God forbid, exercise, right? Like, I think that's a waste of time for a lot of people who don't consider the fact that when you look at the blue zones, right, these areas where people are living a disproportionately long period of time, they're not taking like an hour at the beginning of the day or an hour at the end of the day to do uh, an exercise session. And that's time that adds up too. I mean, you and I are talking right now, and I don't know if this is a, a video podcast or not, but as you can see, like I'm walking on a treadmill and I'll walk a good six to eight miles each day while I'm at work. And, you know, it's different than my wife who's out. I mean, my wife is outside right now. She's pushing a wheelbarrow. She's hauling alfalfa down to the goats. She's pushing around our little mobile chicken coop. She's moving rocks. She's gardening. She's pulling weeds. I mean, that really is more of an, an ancestral example of low level physical activity all day long. But, you know, as an author and a podcaster and someone who is relegated to spending a lot of time in front of the computer, for me, I've just had to learn how to kind of hack my personal environment in my office to allow me to engage in that same type of low level physical activity that we see prevalent in a lot of these blue zones. You know, there's a kettlebell by the door of my office. There's a, there's a hex bar in the room next door. That's always loaded up with a few plates. There's a pull-up bar right below the stairs going upstairs. Uh, there's, there's like a mini trampoline outside the door of my office. And so I've always got these little movement snacks and work breaks and even brief bursts of explosive activity during the day so that by the end of the day, my exercise sessions are relatively brief. Like, you know, uh, tonight I know what my workout's going to be. I've got three Tabata sets, each one separated by 30 kettlebell swings. The Tabata sets are on an aerosol bike. Uh, the kettlebell swings are on a little mat right beside that. I'll drop down and do planks for my recovery, and that'll be about a 20-minute workout session. If I have low-level physical activity all day long and I'm making a point to, to take the stairs, to lift heavy stuff, to hang, to move during the day, it frees up a ton of time for me to not have to feel like I got to you know get in the car, drive to the gym, spend an hour at the gym, get back in the car, drive home, et cetera, et cetera. So 
you know, I, I think that that even though it tends to be glorified and respected a lot more than say like time spent on Facebook, even time spent exercising is something that that I think uh, sometimes uses up valuable hours that someone could spend being more productive. Well, the other part of that for me, Ben, since I'm 53 years old. Uh, I'm noticing that it's difficult to recover, especially from an enthusiastic exercise session that lasts a while, whether it's at the gym or going for a, a you know, a endurance training session. And it's troubling to me because I don't want to be tired in the days following my workouts. I'm trying to be a good guy and, and stay fit and delay aging. Uh, so I've kind of transitioned into more of a routine like you described where the hex bar is waiting there. I might pull some stretch cords, which is an extremely challenging workout that if it only lasts for five minutes, you're working hard and then you're accumulating this body of work, even in brief interspersed uh, manner which can help you be more productive cognitively, but you also avoid kind of that, uh, that trashed uh, existence where you went over the edge and had a workout that takes too long to recover from to really be considered healthy. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, I mean, another thing I'm a fan of is this single set to failure training, right? Like you need about two, two and a half minutes of time under tension for the muscle uh, to be able to respond in terms of satellite cell proliferation, mitochondrial density, uh, you know, formation, fast twitch muscle fiber, et cetera. And uh, that can be achieved pretty easily and conveniently via, you know, incredibly slow training. And granted, you miss out on some of the explosive aspects and all fiber composition usage via this method. But I kind of have changed a little bit to where I'll finish up each single super slow set to failure with a few explosive reps at the end of the set. And, you know, for example, like, like I mentioned, I'm traveling to Vegas this weekend, you know, we'll land, we'll go get ready for the fight. I'll slip down to the gym for 20 minutes. It only takes me 15 to 20 minutes to do single set chest press to failure, pull down to failure, shoulder press to failure, seated row to failure, leg press to failure, right? Two to two and a half minutes. You finish up with as many explosive partial range of motion sets or reps as you can bang out and you're just done. I mean, it's easy. You're not sore for days and days afterwards. Um, I've monitored my heart rate variability during a workout like that, and it drops extremely low, which is a very good sign, actually, that you're activating the sympathetic nervous system. You know, it's like uh, barbell back squats, right? Like those are a very good way to drive your heart rate variability very low during the training session. And we all hear that high HRV is a good thing, but actually during a workout, you want your HRV, if you're looking to get the most bang for your buck, to be really low during the workout so that you know you've just drained your nervous system, but it's only for a brief period of time. And then you're, and then you're up and out and done. And that's actually how I maintain my strength and my muscle when I travel because there's not a lot of cognitive fatigue either, right? Like I can be tired. I can whatever land in, in, I just got back from Tokyo. You know, I can, I can land in Tokyo. I can duck into the hotel gym, do that, be done, walk out and know I've got my strength training in for the week. And I try and do that two times a week, uh, especially when I'm, when I'm on heavy bouts of travel and I can piece together a workout like that, just about anywhere on the face of the planet, even in the absence of machines, you, know, you can use resistance bands, you can use body weight, you can use dumbbells, you can use kettlebells, but that's another really effective and efficient way to get the minimum effective dose of exercise. So you're talking a 20 minute session twice a week can be the centerpiece of you maintaining strength and training for all manner of these uh, endeavors, peak performance competitions. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's those kind of little things that, that add up that that's not going to turn you into like uh, you know, uh, a, a great, let's say, you know, in my case, like, like, you know, a triathlete or a Spartan athlete. But when you combine something like that with the low level physical activity during the day, um, I do a Tabata set usually three times a week, those quick four minute Tabata sets. I do every single morning when the coffee is heating up or the water is heating up for coffee or for tea, I do about 10 minutes of mobility work and breath work, meaning I'm kind of getting the equivalent of 60 to 90 minutes worth of massage therapy each week, just kind of like self-inflicted as a little morning habit. Uh, and then um, the only other two key workouts that I do during the week, um, actually there's three, the three key workouts I do during the week. One is for mitochondria. So I do once a week, usually on Tuesday, five to six 30-second efforts. 
all out with full recovery periods. The recovery periods usually take about three to four minutes. So really long recovery periods, but that's it. That hits my mitochondrial density. Um, I'm already hitting lactate tolerance with the Tabata sets that I just kind of throw in wherever they seem to fit. They only take four minutes. You can just do them wherever. And like I mentioned, I just sprinkle about three of those throughout the week. Uh, and then VO2 max, I usually do that on Thursdays. And that's also very simple. We know the body will build maximum oxygen utilization with about a four minute effort. So I do four four minute efforts with four minute recovery periods. Those four minute efforts suck. They're at maximum sustainable pace, but I only need to do that once a week to maintain VO2 max. So I have one mitochondrial set, one VO2 max set. And then finally on the weekend, at some point, I do some sort of physical activity that's slightly more intense than the low level physical activity of me, say, walking on the treadmill while I'm talking to you. Sometimes it's a you know, like our mutual friend Mark Sisson esque paddleboard session. Sometimes it is a hike. Sometimes it's a bike ride where I'll just go run all my errands on a Saturday morning. But I try and move for about one and a half to two hours. It's always fasted, right? So I'm enhancing my fat burning capacity. I call this stamina or endurance or whatever you want to call it. But I remember when I was an Ironman, you know, that you do that, you know, three to five days a week, right? You'd have a long session once a week, fasted hour and a half to two hour session where I'm out just doing something that's slightly more intensive than my low level physical activity that I'm doing during a typical weekday. That's another kind of key session for me. And sometimes that's a race, right? Like a race counts too. So, uh, I spoke with Joel Jameson recently. You probably know him from a prominent MMA trainer and, uh, recovery based training concepts. And he told me something interesting and I'm still thinking about it. And I wonder what your opinion is that when it comes to recovery, where you have to recover from the Spartan race or whatever you did, uh, and we have uh, one choice of sitting on the couch and watching Netflix and eating popcorn versus some carefully considered types of efforts, workouts, all the things you mentioned, a, a mobility stretching session or brief intervals with long recovery. Do you think there is a way to be to, to accelerate recovery from the baseline example of sitting on the couch for a day or two days? Oh, absolutely. So some of the better things, uh, one would be hot, cold contrast. I'm a huge fan of, let's say, sacrificing the day after the workout that was very hard for you or a day after a race with, for example, 15 minutes in the sauna, five minutes cold shower, three times through. That that's an hour of recovery. That's a time when I'll put on, you know, an, a, a heat resistant or an underwater MP3 player and just go back and forth with hot cold contrast. I actually like infrared for that because the infrared penetrates a little bit more deeply into the tissue. You get a little bit better cardiovascular response, a little bit better heat shock protein increase, and I have a cold pool outside. I actually have one of those endless swimming pools, but I keep it super cold. That's out in the forest behind the house. The sauna's in my basement. So I'll do 50 minutes of sauna, head out to the cold pool, just tread water, hang around in the cold pool for five minutes and go back and forth. That, that's, a, that's, that's one perfect way to recover and put, uh, put work into your body without necessarily sitting around. Um, another one that would be considered a form of cellular exercise because of its ability to open and close some of the channels on cell membranes would be this thing called pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, PEMF. There are full body mats that they sell and so that I can get more bang for my buck, uh, if I'm getting a massage, if I'm taking a nap, whatever the case may be, I'll, I own a couple of these mats and I'll lay on them. And you can you can feel your body vibrating as you lay on them, but you're getting a really good removal of inflammation and a similar effect to this more ancestral practice of earthing or grounding as you do if you were outside on the planet, but in a more concentrated manner, that's another very good way to enhance recovery, to enhance blood flow, and to decrease inflammation. Um, I'm also a fan of you know low-level physical activity, you know, like swimming or walking or whatever, but uh, gradated compression would be another. I've got a pair of these Normatec compression boots that, that kind of milk the metabolic byproducts like calcium or any residual lactate out of the muscle and back up towards the heart. And that's, again, something, even if you are sitting around on the couch, you can, you can put on your legs, they make them for the arms, they make them for the low back and the torso. And it's, you know, gradated means that very similar, like gradated compression 
compression tights, which cost more, but are a better form of compression. They're tight towards the extremities and then get looser as they come up towards the heart. So you're, you're really getting a good milking action. That That's another one that I like. Um, and then there's even this concept of what's called photobiomodulation, which um, I've caught flack for just based on the fact that Dr. about how I pull down my pants for like 20 minutes during the day while I'm standing at my standing desk and, and bathe my balls in infrared light uh, based on the idea that about a 600 to an 800 nanometer wavelength of light has been shown to increase mitochondrial activity, the Leydig cells in the testes. So you get an increase in testosterone. I do this every day. Uh, I do, you know, there, there are other things that I do, uh, but you know, since, since I quit doing Ironman triathlon, my testosterone has gone from 300 and currently it's at 900. And that's a daily practice of mine is I do this photobiomodulation, but it's also great for blood flow. It's great for collagen and also assists with recovery. Uh, they even make one for the head called a Vilite. The one that I use on my desk is called a Juve. The one for the head is called a Vilite, and it actually causes, in addition to mitochondrial activity of neural tissue, a production of nitric oxide, which is kind of like Viagra for the whole body, enhances blood flow. And there was actually a recent article, I forget the journal it was in, but it talked about how the effects of this were similar to using like an illegal performance enhancing aid when you use photobiomodulation. So they might be someday you know, stripping red lights out of the buses of Tour de France cyclists. You never know. But this uh, this near and far infrared therapy via photobiomodulation, very similar to sunlight, but in a more kind of concentrated format with the ability to be able to do it, say, indoors while you're, you know, while you're working, getting things done. That's another pretty good one. Now, there, there are a lot of other, I mean, we, we could talk about recovery all day long. Um, but for me, probably the most profound thing I ever did. And I realized this is a little bit more elitist and may not be available to everyone, but I, I went to Park City, Utah, and I, I was sedated for four hours. And I had all my joints up and down my spine, knees, ankles, face, wrists, elbows, shoulders, everything uh, injected with bone marrow aspirate that was taken out of my hips. And so I literally uh, refilled every single joint in my body with stem cells. And when you look at the stem cell theory of aging or joint breakdown, it's based on this idea that endogenous stem cell availability uh, and, and the, uh, the availability of what are called pluripotent stem cells that can differentiate into other tissue or that can enhance repair and recovery tends to decrease with age. So I essentially, you know, at the age of 37, just refilled everything. And so I have all these new stem cells available and it, it takes about two to three months to kick in, but I can, I have to be careful. Like I can work out every day now pretty hard if I want to and bounce back the next day and feel a profound difference in soreness and, and workout efficacy after doing this stem cell procedure. It's called a uh, they're one of the few places in the world that does it, this this clinic in Park City, Utah, but it's called a full body stem cell makeover. And then I actually tacked on what they call the cosmetic and sexual enhancement piece of that to where they inject your face, they inject your dick in three different locations, and then they do the hairline as well. So sky's the limit as far as what you can do with stem cells, but that's kind of like the, the top of the totem pole for me when it comes to enhancing recovery. So we're going to check in with you like, 12 years from now and you're still going to be 37 that's what you're saying that or my my dick will have turned gray and fallen off and i will have lost all my hair we'll see oh i guess we could put it a little e sign on this episode now thank you ben that was great yeah uh so are you gonna <laughs> hey, that's live why god to... <laughs> made like bird sounds and, and honky honky yeah. sounds and you, 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 can, you can edit it out for all the kids are you going to live to 170 uh, like Dave Asprey and uh, the others that are uh, pursuing this goal? Well, look, my, my take on longevity, Brad, is if you're just living a long time so that you can be that person who lives a long time, sees all your friends die and you know think, ha-ha, I'm not dead yet, uh, so that you can be that person who whatever um, – has the most years, makes the most money, uh, has, has, has the most sex, you know, whatever it is, the reason that you're living a long period of time, I think that's all just grasping at straws and is a relatively selfish pursuit. But if you're living a long time so that you can better fulfill your purpose in life, because everybody was born with a unique skill set, everybody was born with the ability to be able to change the world and to make it a better place. 
And I think that, and this is one thing that kind of irks me about, say, for example, many elements of modern Christianity, right? We have people who are talking about, you know, saving souls and positivity and peace and love and joy and spreading salvation. Yet you go to a church potluck and it's all Doritos and Twinkies and obesity and cardiovascular disease because these people aren't actually caring for their temples so that they can be around for a longer period of time to truly make the world a better place. And so I think if you've identified your purpose in life, which we know is actually very important for longevity, this concept of ikigai, being able to get out of bed in the morning and have a reason for living. We could, I mean, that, that's as important as sunshine and fresh water and physical activity and wild plant intake and not smoking and all these other things we know help people to live a long period of time. But if you can clearly identify that purpose – you know, and I can clearly identify mine. My, my purpose in life is to empower people to live a more adventurous and joyful and fulfilling life, to empower people to live a more adventurous and joyful and fulfilling life. Now, if I can, if I can be alive for as long a period of time to do that, then I think that I am doing my duty as a human being to make this world a better place. And so yeah, I would be overjoyed to live to 170 years old, provided that during all of those years, I'm able to really, truly help people and fulfill my purpose in life. But if I'm just living a long time to feel good and sit in my basement in an infrared sauna with a clay mask on with coffee at my butt, that's, you know, that, that's kind of a selfish pursuit. Or if you're in a bunker without any interaction with other humans because the, the world's in that state, yeah, yeah, not a big goal anymore. Right, right. Or if you're cold and hungry and libido-less because, you know, all you're doing is, is fasting and taking cold showers. Oh, boy. I like that take, man. Very, very fresh. That's, that's the, the, the defining uh, path of longevity that's going to predict longevity at the same time when you have the right goal in place. Yeah, the right goal. And, and, you know, again, not to kick this horse to death, but the, you know, that concept of family dinners, when we look at a lot of those things I rattled off, like, you know, things that, that fit into that Venn diagram of longevity, we have all these areas where people are living a disproportionately long period of time from Okinawa to Sardinia to Nicoya to Loma Linda. We see things that aren't that surprising, right? like no smoking, wild plant intake, probably because of the mild hormetic stressors that eating wild plants actually inflicts upon the human body, which is why I think the paleo diet is stupid because it, it restricts the intake of certain things that they say are assailants to the human gut or you know, don't fall into the path of natural human ancestral eating patterns. Uh, but I think you can eat just about anything on this planet provided that you ferment and you soak it and you sprout it and you treat it properly and you eat in moderation. Uh, so wild plant intake, uh, legume intake would be another, which is definitely not not paleo, but uh, I, I don't think there's anything magic about legumes, even though I have a bunch of wonderful split mung beans uh, in a stew upstairs. I think that really it is the absence of the processed and packaged carbohydrates, starches, and sugars, and the fact that legumes, beans, nuts, seeds, et cetera, are replacing those as more stable forms of glucose. I think that that low inflammation and low glycemic variability are two of the most profound things that you can track and manage when it comes to living a long time. So no smoking, wild plant intake, legume intake, one we already talked about, low-level physical activity, usually outdoors, right? Not exercise, but just moving outdoors. Uh, and then finally, the last one is just relationships, love, social life, time with the family, time with friends, laughter, often over a, a glass of tannin-rich alcohol at the end of the day, that is as important as many of these other variables. And uh, furthermore, we don't see a lot of these blue zones doing a lot of the, of the biohacking. I certainly think there's something to be said for better living through science, but ultimately, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to really dial in the low-hanging fruit, and I would put purpose in life right in there with those other variables like, you know, eating plants, controlling your blood sugar, not smoking, spending time with your friends and your family, uh, and you know, moving around during the day and knowing what your purpose in life is. Well said. Peter Atiyah uh, talks about this low-hanging fruit, too, as he's pursuing the cutting edge of longevity medicine and so forth. But he said that you could get 80% of the way there, 80% of your longevity potential, just by doing 
the basic stuff that you uh, just enumerated. Uh, he said eating stuff that your great grandmother could have eaten and not eating stuff that wasn't around. So uh, you're kind of on the on the far end here. And if we had to drop in or sprinkle in uh, a few cutting edge practices, could you go with some uh, some some top three or top five, or someone's enthusiastic, maybe not ready to invest in a juve light? Although it was pretty cool, I uh, saw the booth at Paleo FX, and I've seen your video, and I have the little handheld uh, uh, red light at, at six sixty or whatever the proper wavelength is. So I use that yeah. on uh, certain certain occasions, and hopefully it's working. But I know some of this stuff is difficult to discern the return on investment. But if you can drop in some that are uh, of of great appeal to a peak performance enthusiast that's uh, busy and trying to trying to squeeze in some some fun stuff. Sure. I'll try to avoid talking about things I already mentioned, like PMF or photobiomodulation uh, or, or you know, cold thermogenesis or something like that, because I, I would consider all of those to, in many ways, be, you know, a, an example of better living through science that we might not see our, our ancestors doing in many cases, but, or, or these areas of the blue zones. But that kind of, you know, when you think about it, photobiomodulation kind of simulates sunlight, Cryotherapy chambers or cold pools kind of simulate, you know, not having air conditioning, getting out in the cold and working sometimes. Uh, PEMF kind of simulates being outside on the earth and the ground. So we can draw ancestral or natural corollaries to many of these modern biohacking spendier pieces of equipment that simply concentrate those practices into a shorter period of time or allow people to do them when they're living a post-industrial lifestyle indoors because that's how you pay the bills. You got to be in front of a computer. You can't be outside in the sunlight, so you have a photobiomodulation panel at your desk, and you can't work outside all day and be a little bit chilly, but you can like maybe step into a cryotherapy chamber at the little health center next door to your office for three minutes, and maybe you can't sleep outdoors and camp and walk around barefoot, but you can sleep at night on a PEMF mat, right? So so these are all kind of examples of you know, of being able to tap into a more natural way of living and using better living through science to do so. And I'm certainly open-minded to a lot of those principles. To reply to your question, if I could throw a few more in there that I'm interested in right now and have been experimenting with um, uh, for for kind of like the longevity or just the better living through science component, uh, one would be uh, hydrogen-rich water. There are a lot of these machines now or tablets that will dissolve H2 gas into water that seems to very significantly influence the NF-kappa-B pathway, which is an inflammatory pathway. We named already that inflammation is something that's that's correlated with decreased lifespan just due to everything from cholesterol oxidation to cellular damage to skin damage to vascular damage. And so what I like about hydrogen-rich water, you can you can buy a spendier like five to $6,000 hydrogen-rich water generator machine, or you can simply buy tablets and put them into a normal glass of water is that they blunt the inflammatory response without blunting the hormetic response to exercise. Uh, green tea polyphenols actually act similarly. Uh, those are those are two examples of just a few of the very rare antioxidants that are something you could even take in the presence of exercise without making exercise not as beneficial or as effective. So I start off every day, I've got one of these hydrogen water generators. I have a big glass mason jar full of hydrogen rich water. And when I travel, I take these tablets with me. So that's that's one example. Um, another example, let's see, I, I talked about infrared, but just this concept generally of hyperthermia, heat exposure and heat treatments uh, that, in addition to cold, is something I do quite frequently. I kind of have this rule every day. I got to do something that gets me really hot and something that gets me really cold. Um, the heat component is sometimes with a sauna, but then there's this other thing that I use, kind of like a, I, I'm trying to name the things I would use daily. You know, I have that hydrogen-rich water daily now. Another thing I do daily when I'm at home is I have this thing called a biomat, a biomat, and it generates a whole bunch of heat. It's not so uncomfortably hot that you can't nap on it, and I like to take a post-lunch siesta. So I go up and I lay on this biomat. Uh, it uh, is just basically infrared therapy generated by a mat. And 
Uh, it's very warm. Sometimes you get a little bit of a sweat. If I'm sick, I can literally wrap myself in that thing and sweat it out. Or if I'm detoxing, you can wrap yourself in like these, you know, silver mylar space blankets and lay on top of your biomat and just sweat things out and lay there. Um, it's kind of a cool tool to have around. You know, my kids even have a biomat mini. They've got, <laughs> they've got similar to you. They have, they have a, a mini red light that they use called a Juve mini. My kids have a lot of this stuff up in their bedroom. You know, anything I found to profoundly impact my own health. I try to expose my kids to. They have a big glass of hydrogen rich water before they go to school each morning. So they kind of do their own mini version of a lot of this stuff. Um, and then they have, uh, they have play dates. The kid comes over and then it goes back and his parents say, what'd you do over there? Oh, we did some red light exposure. We did some hot and cold therapy. Oh, how fun. We upside down from a yoga trapeze in the living room and did probiotic enemas. It was a great time at the Greenfield house. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm kidding. My kids' friends don't, don't do that yet. Uh, okay. So we've got hydrogen rich water, um, heat therapy. And I guess if I could finish with a third, I'm like looking around my office. Um, Oh, here's something interesting. Um, again, I mean, you, you asked, so I'm going to, I'm going to give you something that would be kind of more technology based and maybe not something everyone would own, but something I think is cool to own for people who like to own nice things. Um, let me explain to you first why I have this. We know that cells can communicate via a variety of different communication mechanisms, right? Uh, most people know that that nerve signals will travel uh, using primarily uh, neurotransmitters that cross synaptic clefts and carry messages uh, from one nerve to another. So neurotransmitters would be one form of communication. Hormones would be another form of communication. Uh, we know that based on more recent research that uh, cells can communicate with light as well via what are called biophotons. Uh, we know that cells can communicate via tiny little vesicles called exosomes, which actually when I did my stem cell injections, I had a bunch of exosomes inject the stem cells to help to carry the stem cells to different areas of the body. But one way that cells communicate, and in particular, one way with which mitochondria communicate is via free radicals. And we all think free radicals are bad, but what happens is as, as you uh, shuttle electrons down the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, uh, they should be used to generate ATP. But when too much ATP is available, such as you've been you know, stuffing your face with too many Twinkies, uh, the electrons tend to back up. And when the electrons back up, you get free radical spillage out into the mitochondrial matrix and into the rest of the cell, and it can cause membrane damage, and it can cause uh, uh, reduction in mitochondrial activity. And so one of the ways with which mitochondria regulate the actual activity of the mitochondrial uh, electron transport chain is by sensing the free radical availability within a cell and then altering the production of ATP accordingly. So it's a very robust way to control mitochondrial activity and keep mitochondria healthy uh, via free radical signaling. Well, you can simulate this same type of free radical signaling without necessarily introducing more free radicals into the body by actually breathing air that is infused with the same signals as these free radicals carry. And, and this is a device on my desk called a, you know, you probably can't see it. I can kind of drag the, the nasal cannula. But sometimes when I'm writing, I'll, I'll put this nasal cannula on. It looks like this. And you can't see the machine that it's connected to, but it's called a nano V a nano V and you fill it with water and it actually exposes the water to the same signals as the free radicals. And then you breathe this in. And I did a stent where I tested my telomere length uh, when, when I was using this. I used it for about three months and tested my telomere length and it knocked about three years off my, uh, my biological age, not my chronological age, but my biological age when I use this thing. And, and apparently it's because it can also do a good job at DNA repair via that enhanced mitochondrial activity. So that one's called the Nano V. It's made by a company in Seattle. And again, for like the desk bound person who wants to make their body better uh, just while they're getting things done during the day or that, you know, athlete who wants to add a little bit of extra recovery in, you know, it's a few thousand bucks, but that's another one, you know, probably just because it's right here under my nose and I thought of it, that that's uh, another thing that I use that I think is quite interesting and I've found to be pretty efficacious. So hopefully I wasn't too far off the deep end. Well, you also mentioned the nap, so I'd love to know 
your your daily routine in, in complete detail. You talk about the family dinner a little late, trying to get to bed by 10, and then uh, talk us through when you wake up and what you're doing. You already mentioned the uh, the exercise protocols that drop into certain days of the week. Yeah. Um, a few of the things that I do that are like daily must staples for me would be a, that, that 10, maximum 15 minutes of mobility work and breath work and mobility, you know, dynamic stretching, foam rolling, stuff like that in the morning. Uh, daily must for me is like gratitude journal every single day. I write down what I'm grateful for, uh, what I learned that morning because I read for a little bit each morning while I'm laying in bed and then who I can pray for or help or serve that day. So I try and start every day with gratefulness uh, and with kind of a, an attitude of helping others. Um, I, uh, what else are daily must the low low physical activity during the day. Typically I'll have lunch. And then after lunch, I drink a little bit of reishi tea, uh, which kind of settles me down. It's a wonderful mushroom tea that kind of relaxes you. And then I go and I, I lay on that bio mat and I, I, I often will pull on those, those graded compression boots at the same time. So any, anytime I can double up on something like that, I'll do it. I lay there and I sleep and you know, usually I put in my headphones because sometimes other things are happening around the house or people are over. And so I'll listen to, uh, usually I'll use either an app called Sleepstream or there's another app called Brain FM Sleepstream and Brain FM are two apps that I find help me relax when I play them through headphones. Brain FM is more like music, but it's they call it artificial intelligence music that they've programmed for either focus or for sleep or for like a power nap or whatever, you know, you pick your poison on the app and the sleep stream. That's also kind of like a DJ for sleep, right? You can play binaural beats that lull you into alpha or delta or gamma frequencies. You can play piano. You can play white noise, pink noise, brown noise. I forget all the colors of noise whatever, pur purple noise, violet noise, crimson noise. Uh, anyways, they can play all these noises that, that kind of, kind of cover up other external noises and help you to sleep. So I lay on that, um, wake up, get a little bit more work done. Uh, and I hang out with the kids for a while when they get home from school. Uh, we, we outsource their education by sending them to a private school. But I'm a firm believer that the moment your kids walk in the door from school, your role as a parent educator begins. And that's when I try to teach my kids all the things they're not learning at school. So we do everything from meditation and manifestation practice to shooting the bow, to doing plant foraging, to cooking, to playing instruments, to just basically doing all the things that help them to become more well-rounded, you know, little Renaissance men and to to learn the things that they're not getting uh, in, in their academic institution where admittedly I like the fact they're learning how to be good little factory workers, how to play well with others, how to cooperate, how to engage in, in team tasks. Uh, they're also learning from people who are better able to teach them the things I would probably suck at teaching them. Like, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, they, they've got Lego programming uh, for, for making Lego robots right now. And they've got a really good Spanish teacher and I kind of suck at Spanish. And so there are things that that just, you know, really, I think are are smart and good time management to outsource to others. So anyways, though, I try to be done with a lion's share of the hard work for the day by the time my kids get home from school around four. So hang out with the kids, uh, you know, throw down a, a, like a late afternoon or an early evening workout, which is when I'll do something like I described to you earlier, you know, one of those quick intense sessions I described to you earlier. And then after that workout, I will typically disappear down into my office to kind of put out for around 45 minutes to an hour all the last minute things I don't want to be thinking about during our family dinner. And then I come upstairs, I, I lend a hand to Jess and the boys. Sometimes we prepare a meal together. Um, sometimes Jess is cooking something and the, the boys and I are helping out, you know, making a dessert or, you know, uh, open up a bottle of red wine and decanting that or whatever the case may be. And we gather around, we have a family dinner. Uh, we, we finish up. I play the kids a little guitar or ukulele, and um, then we all, we're all in bed by about 9.30 or 10. I try and read a book every day, so I'll usually uh, lay in bed and read. Um, I read very quickly. I have a pen underline. I, I go through the book, you know, table of contents, skim, go through each chapter, fold over pages, write, underline. A lot of times it's for my podcast, so I'm thinking of all the cool questions I want to ask that person on my podcast after I've read the book. And then I 
I turn on something called a chili pad, which cools the the sheets underneath me so I can sleep at a low body temperature. I turn on this thing called a body balance mat, which produces those same PEMF signals I was talking about, but it does it while I'm sleeping. So I sleep all night long, same as if I were sleeping outdoors. I uh, put on a sleep mask and I get a little lavender oil diffuser and I put, I put all this stuff on that just helps me just crush every single night of sleep. I love to, to sleep just amazingly. So I'll sleep uh, anywhere from, from seven and a half to nine hours. I never set the alarm. I just wake up when I wake up. Usually it's around, eh, usually 6.30 or so, right around in there on average. Uh, and then I, I get up and have another amazing day. Sounds dialed, man. We should have a giveaway for uh, spend the 24-hour day with Ben Greenfield in Spokane and, and get involved in all these little fun toys and contraptions and practices that we have emanating yeah. from your headquarters out there. I've got a couple of I, I coach nine people, uh, basically, you know, executives, and I help with their sleep and their HRV and their nutrition and their food. And a couple of guys have come up and, and spent the weekend with me. And uh yeah, it's always interesting for folks to to kind of see that blend of ancestral living and hanging out with the chickens and goats outside and then the modern biohacking indoors. So it's a, it's a unique environment, but I, I like it out here. We live on 10 acres out in Spokane, Washington, and it's my little oasis I can come home to and kind of detox in and relax in before the next old foray of speaking and traveling and flying begins. I like that dream team. Nine people, nine and only nine. So, boy, yeah. what a what a plum ticket to get to join that squad. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, you know, I used to be a personal trainer for a long time, and I ran all these gyms and personal training studios. And I still like to scratch that itch of getting out there and working with folks and putting them through workouts and stuff. So, typically, when I go to speak at a conference, I'll I'll like lead morning workouts or do like evening Q and A sessions and. You know, I'd, I still like to get out there and, and train people. But honestly, most of my work's done with just those nine people. It's all the, uh, uh, an app called Boxer, which is like their walkie-talkie communication with me, uh, you know, Skype calls, emails, and, and all, you know, kind of online consulting. Not a lot of, of, uh, of like, uh, you know, brick-and-mortar one-on-one work anymore. So, so you were on the, the doctor path, as we learned early in your story, uh, just like Mark Sisson, and Mark Sisson was diverted because someone knocked on his dorm room and alumni wanted to see his old place, and he walked in and Mark had like completely retrofitted and rebuilt the dorm with all this advanced construction skills, and uh, the alum said, why, why are you going to be, why are you going to med school? You should be doing this stuff, and that got him thinking and diverted. Uh, what about you? You were on that med school track, and then something happened, and here we are today. Yeah, uh, you know, I was actually telling you and Mark about that. Like, it's kind of funny because, like, Mark was a triathlete who got sick of it and realized he was destroying his body and quit. And I kind of had the same thing. I I got accepted to a bunch of medical schools and opted not to go into medicine uh, because I became pretty disillusioned with modern medicine and uh, um, got offered more money in surgical hip and knee sales and decided to go into that instead. And then didn't like that and, and went back to fitness. Uh, I was a painter all through college, kind of like Mark was, and. Um, unfortunately though, I, I've not developed my, my paddleboard and, and, uh, ultimate Frisbee game, uh, and with the, with the same amount of finesse as he has, but yeah, it's, it's kind of funny how we overlap a little bit, but yeah, I mean, like I've always had a, a voracious interest in the human body and brain ever since I was a you know tennis player in high school and wanted to learn how to run and fuel my body and lift weights to become a better tennis player to, you know, my foray into bodybuilding in college where I really delved into the bro science and learned how to you know, eat six cans of tuna fish for dinner mixed with a little bit of relish and ketchup to make it taste good and, you know, strip as much fat off the human body as possible and get as swole as I could. I used to be, well, I'm at 175 now. I weighed 215 when I was a competitive bodybuilder, 215 and 3% body fat. And uh, then I then I went into the next healthiest sport on the face of the planet, Ironman triathlon after that and spent, you know, eight or nine years doing Ironman. And then, uh, you know, now do a relatively more sane sport, but Spartan racing and obstacle course racing, which is shorter, more intense, a little more functional in my opinion. But yeah, the medicine thing, um, 
you know, just because I was so interested in physiology and nutrition and I got my master's degree in biomechanics and exercise physiology, I really saw myself delving into sports medicine or orthopedic surgery. But unfortunately, and especially more so during the hip and knee surgical sales job that I had uh, after completing my master's degree, I just did not run into any doctors who seemed happy with their job, who encouraged me to go to medical school, who weren't overloaded with cranky patients and a broken medical system and overpriced insurance and and all these issues. And I just, every single time it was a negative experience that I'd walk into a doctor's office or a hospital or a surgical ward. And so I just, you know, I, I loved fitness and physical culture a lot more. So that's, that's what I wound up uh, going into and doing. You know, I, I remember I wandered into the gym across the street from the apartment I was living in and asked for a job. And at that point I had a, a really good resume. You know, I was a certified strength conditioning coach, a personal trainer, a certified nutritionist. I'd spent five years training people all through college. And so they offered me a job, and within two years, I'd, I'd partnered up with a local physician, and uh, we launched a series of sports medicine clinics in which I was the director of sports performance. But I was this really like geeky, propeller hat wearing, kind of nerded out version of a personal trainer where we had, you know, EKG machines and direct and indirect calorimetry for metabolic rate assessments and high speed video cameras and functional training centers and and you know a whole host of medical professionals on staff like physical therapists and chiropractic docs and sports medicine physicians and massage therapists. And so I, you know, we really established ourselves as the people you come to and nothing else is working for say performance or for body composition. And several years into that, one of the docs uh, nominated me uh, with the NSCA to be America's uh, top personal trainer. And I got voted as America's top personal trainer and everything just kind of Set up from there in terms of speaking and writing and and uh, advising and even investing in health and fitness and nutrition companies and that's kind of how I've spent the past decade of my life is is kind of this new chapter of you know media and speaking and advising and investing and writing and consulting and um, that's what I do now but that's that's kind of long story short of of how I I came to do what I do now uh, and this Kion thing is a uh, recent adventure. Let's let's finish with a little little plug for how you've pulled everything together into this operation. Yeah, I mean, look, my my passion, you know, and even in, in college, you know, I studied a lot of pharmaceuticals, a lot of nutrition, a lot of biochemistry, a lot of microbiology, a lot of organic chemistry. I love to study ingredients and formulations. And, um, you know, I'm currently geeking out on everything one can do to enhance the health of the mitochondria from PQQ to coenzyme Q10 to SKQs to D-ribose to ATP. Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, case in point, I'm, I'm developing right now a longevity formula. And before that I developed, I wanted a really clean energy bar that wasn't like a greasy, ketosis bar that, that, you know, crumbles and falls apart when you open the package and uh, it stays stable, you know, under heat and also doesn't turn into a brick like a power bar does in the cold. And so I developed a bar. And before that, I developed a really clean, organic, antioxidant rich coffee. Uh, you know, I've got a, a few formulas for the gut, kind of a complete joint formula with turmeric and acetyl myristoliate and glucosamine chondroitin and, and black pepper and all these things that, that help the joints. And so I consider Kian to be kind of like my playground for creating new and novel formulations that are just basically supplements that uh, really are things I developed to scratch my own itch. Uh, just, just like, you know, like gratitude journal I wrote, you know, it scratches my own itch of the gratitude practice I'm doing every morning anyways. I, I take all the supplements I develop, you know, every morning or every evening or, you know, during the day with a coffee and a bar. And, um, so Keon is, it's basically a, you know, first and foremost, a supplements company. I might eventually begin to develop fitness gear and, um, you know, I have some books there. We do some coaching and consulting. We have a, like a university where we train personal trainers and nutritionists and, you know, some of my methods and, and more advanced tactics from, you know, biohacking to, to ancestral living. But ultimately it's, it's just, you know, a, a supplements and healthy living company that, uh, it's kind of my playground for every new idea I get to be able to, to develop some formulation that, that I hope will help a lot of people out. That's K-I-O-N, so we can go check that out. And should we go find you at other websites, podcasts? you want to plug a few things? Yeah, let's just get Keon.com. And then, um, yeah, I mean, what I tell people, anytime, anytime you're wondering about something that, I, that I, my opinion on 
whatever LSD and psilocybin or, uh, you know, or minimal effective dose of training or whatever, just Google my name plus whatever you're curious about. And usually you'll find something I've written on the topic or some podcast I've recorded on the topics. So that's, that's usually, uh, the best way to do it. But my, my actual website with my podcast and my blog and everything, uh, where I do a weekly article and a, a twice weekly podcast is bengreenfieldfitness.com. Oh my gosh, man. W- will you do me a favor? Don't ever change. Because you are you are one of a kind. I appreciate you taking the time to talk and look forward to catching up with you. Hopefully next time I see you, you won't be an accident victim because you, you rallied at Paleo FX. You went on the panel and did your talks and your appearances, but it was right after that, that bike accident. So stay healthy. Keep doing what you're doing. Ben Greenfield from Spokane finishing his treadmill. How many miles did you walk during the show here? Do you have a little meter there? Dude, I'm I'm so over self quantification. I like I, I look at my I look at my sleep when I wake up. I pay attention to my heart rate variability. Uh, that's about it. I don't track anything else. I, you know, I I do look at my steps at the end of the day. Usually, I try to make sure I've taken about fifteen thousand steps at the end of the day. Um, but I'm, I'm at the point now where I kind of know most days I'm doing that, but I have no clue. I've got no meters or anything on this treadmill. It's just a stripped down, no frills, manual treadmill. So, uh, I, I, I don't know, but I've calculated just a few times and it usually comes out to about six to eight miles in any given day. So, okay. Keep going, Ben. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening everybody. All right. Thanks, man. Let's talk about Tribali Foods. If you're super busy and you want a convenient meal to make in a short time, but you don't want to compromise great taste, gosh, doesn't that sound like a commercial? (laughs) It is a commercial, but it's for something super awesome. And these are frozen organic beef and chicken patties and sliders with awesome creative flavors like Mediterranean, chipotle, umami with the mushroom mixed in, and also these sliders, chicken apple and pork sage. What you do is you take this frozen box, cut with the scissors, the beautiful little pre-made patty, Drop it on the pan, cook it up, and it's ready in a few minutes. And this company is a real, live, authentic, girl power, entrepreneur, small business success story, home, kitchen inspired. Welcome, everyone, to the new world where the big multinational beasts that make garbage food are getting knocked off by people who care about what they eat and about their health. And Trebelli was started by my friend Angela Mavridis in Southern California, lifelong family restaurant business member. She was a vegetarian for 35 years, and one day she had a steak, felt great, and started on this path of experimenting with creative ground beef recipes and flavorings in her kitchen. All her friends loved it. She was buying tons of ground meat from Whole Foods, and they're like, hey, what are you doing with this? So she brought them in a little sample. They loved it. They flew her to Texas to meet with the national buyer, and they said, literally, start a business and we will place a large order. So this is a wonderful small business success story with love and attention to everything that goes into this product. Delicious, totally keto-friendly. Go look at the pork mini sliders. We're talking one gram of carbs, 11 grams of protein, 17 grams of fat, and you get 15% off. Just visit tribalifoods.com, T-R-I-B-A-L-I, and enter Get Over Yourself in the coupon field and you are good to go. Ship directly to your door, cold packed, frozen stuff, thawed out in a day, and you have quick dinner, quick lunch. And also available at finer stores like Whole Foods, Whole Dudes, Nugget, Natural Grocers, Super Targets, and launching into Walmart as well. Good job, go girl. Trebellifoods.com. Let's talk about probiotics from Integro Health. Do you want me to sing the messages? Nah. But probiotics are an extremely important concept. Hopefully you're all in on the values, the benefits of nourishing a healthy gut microbiome so you can flourish in life. And that's the name of Integro's product, Flourish a unique, extremely potent, living liquid probiotic. Yes, it's liquid form. How is it different from other probiotics we usually see in pills? 
This is the message from Integro. Microbes continue to thrive and metabolize in their own milieu. Do you like when companies use the word milieu to describe their product? I do. These include short-chain fatty acids, bioactive peptides, amino acids, enzymes, and minerals. The liquid base makes it acid-stable, so microbes can survive the stomach environment and transit to the lower GI tract for integration to give you a healthy gut microbiome. There's 11 different strains in this thing, carefully hand-cultivated in the laboratory with precision to deliver 8 billion total CFU. Why take probiotics? Come on, you have to ask. It's going to strengthen your immune function, reduce systemic inflammation, the root cause of all disease, improve digestion, promote bowel regularity, relieve gas and bloating, get you going again after illness or antibiotic use. That's me because I first got this shipment the very day I returned home from a Mexican vacation and had a stomach illness once again. What a bummer. So sad because I love going down south, but I needed to repair and return to action quickly. So I started guzzling this stuff and had had a wonderful return to health. I'm a very enthusiastic user and will be over the long run because I need all the help I can get. I don't know about you when we're talking about our routine usage of antibiotics, the stress we put on our system and in the environment every single day. I especially notice my gut health is compromised when I engage in overly intensive athletic training, have trouble recovering. My gut is the first thing to go. So this is my go-to product, the Flourish Probiotic in liquid form. Try it yourself. I love the delicious root beer float flavor. Just kidding, man. This stuff is no funny business. This is the real deal. It's very potent. It tastes fine. It goes down okay, but no root beer float flavor. Sorry. Take it. You'll love it. Go look at IntegroHealth.com for more information and to order shipped directly to your door in its unique liquid form. Flourish! Flourish! 